Hello. Or, as they say here in New York, what's happening? I'm Tony Randall. And like Mayor Ed Koch and King Kong and practically everybody else in the world, I love New York. Standing in the heart of Midtown Manhattan, you feel you're in the most exciting city on Earth, a place where the only thing missing is boredom. New York is the cultural and financial capital of the world, a city of skyscrapers so dense you can strain your neck marveling at their magnificence. An enormous bazaar of ideas and the best of everything that money can buy. It's the city where every sort of immigrant has made a home. A city of sprawling parks. A port city where the smell of the sea comes at you when you least expect it. On this Rand McNally video trip, we'll go into the heart of New York, exploring both its well-known sites and some not so well-known. Whether this is your first visit or your hundredth, we'll give you some fresh ideas about how to approach this inexhaustible city. And in the final section of our video trip, we'll share some information to make your visit easier and a lot more fun. Things like how to get here, how to get around, what the weather's like, how to dress, and more. So let's get started and take our first bite of this big apple. New York City dangles at the bottom of New York State, wedged in between New Jersey and Long Island. It's about three quarters of the way up the East Coast from Florida to Maine. Surprisingly, it actually lies at a more southerly latitude than Rome or the French Riviera. When visitors think of New York, most think of Manhattan. Not exactly pleasing to the other four boroughs, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island. But a fact of life they've long got used to. Our tour will be almost exclusively concerned with Manhattan, that skinny sliver of real estate, shaped like a Coney Island hot dog 12 miles long, and about two and a half miles wide at its widest point. With one and a half million inhabitants living in Manhattan alone, it's far and away the most densely populated city in the United States and one of the most crowded in the world. Everyone's first Manhattan impression is usually of Midtown, that area of hustle and bustle and skyscrapers stretching from 34th Street north to 59th Street. Midtown is to New York what wheat is to Kansas, an emblem concentrating much of the power and excitement of the city. Here is the world's nerve center for communications, publishing, fashion, and the sidewalk pretzel vendor. Being surrounded by all the concrete, steel, and glass can be disorienting. So a good way to start your tour and get the lay of the land is at the Empire State Building. From the 102nd floor of the world's third tallest edifice, you can survey the entire city at your feet and the panorama for 50 miles around on those frequent clear days. The view not only prepares you for where you'll be heading, it's a psychological boost to see firsthand that Manhattan really is an island and doesn't go on forever. By the way, the original Waldorf Astoria Hotel, built as two separate hotels by feuding members of the Astor family, once stood at this site. Back down on Fifth Avenue, walk north, uptown that is, past department stores like Lord & Taylor and B. Altman. From the corner at 42nd Street, there's an excellent view of the Chrysler Building two blocks to the right. You'll recognize it by the pyramid of stacked arches at the top. In a race to become the tallest building in the world, the architect had the crown made secretly. The Chrysler kept the distinction of being tallest for only a year, when it was left in the shadow of the Empire State. Rockefeller Center is the centerpiece of Fifth Avenue a testament of faith in technology, capitalism, and the modern age. From the moment you catch sight of the giant gilt statue of Prometheus holding aloft the fire of knowledge, you are drawn in. All around, Art Deco bar reliefs express bold, optimistic visions of the future. Rockefeller Center is a city within a city. It's an enclave of 21 buildings where a quarter of a million people work every day. Originally, the site was intended for an opera house. When the Metropolitan Opera backed out of the deal, John D. Rockefeller Jr. was faced with a gamble, abandon the project or build. In the middle of the Depression, he decided to build. His gamble was obviously successful. As you walk around the complex, pause at the Channel Gardens, which earned their name because they separate the British and French buildings. At the bottom of the gardens lies the lower court, a sea of umbrella tables in summer, and an ice skating rink in winter. 
And you can enjoy a tour of NBC's television studios any time of the year. Across the street rise the Gothic spires and white marble of St. Patrick's Cathedral. It was to St. Patrick's that thousands came to pay their last respects to President John F. Kennedy and Archbishop Terence Cardinal Cook, lying in state. With nearby Saks Fifth Avenue, the high-ticket shopping begins in earnest. A territory of serious bagatelles, a window shopper's delight. Blue Blood Old Reliables like Cartier, Tiffany, and Steuben Glass have been joined by the brash European upstarts inside Trump Tower, Valentino, and a jewelry store called Fred. Don't let the unassuming name fool you. Conspicuous consumption reaches its apex around 57th Street and 5th Avenue. Bloomingdale's, the epitome of New York flash, is a few blocks east. At the Museum of Modern Art on 53rd Street, you'll find permanent collection of Picassos, Matisses, Pollocks, as well as galleries devoted to photography, design, and film. Free summer jazz concerts in the Sculpture Garden take advantage of one of Midtown's most pleasant oases. Eclectic is the byword of the new IBM gallery on 57th Street. Before poring over the paintings, the scientific demonstrations, or the anthropological what-have-you of the rotating exhibits, try out the computerized guides upstairs. At the press of a button or two, you can find out the location and history of just about every cultural institution and point of interest in the city. Along 57th Street are dozens of great art galleries, and they're fun to browse whether or not you have an interest in buying. There's everything from old masters to ultra-modern. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. Of course, the real answer is you go to 57th Street and 7th Avenue. Here, the grand dowager of concert spaces stands like an Italian Renaissance palazzo in brown rust. Tchaikovsky conducted the first orchestral performance here. 1891. Today, the JVC Jazz Festival carries on a rather different tradition. Still, if you've played Carnegie Hall, you've played Olympus. If Carnegie Hall represents the pinnacle of highbrow, Radio City Music Hall, a few blocks south, is the Palace of Pop. It's the largest indoor theater in America. In the Diamond District along 47th Street, you may not uncover a diamond as big as the Ritz, but you won't believe your eyes. 80% of all diamonds bought and sold in the United States are traded here, largely by Hasidic Jews with long side curls flowing below their ears. Step right up, step right up to the blaring mayhem of Times Square. But hey, bud, watch your wallet. Times Square got its name from the New York Times building, erected at 42nd Street, where Broadway and 7th Avenue converge. The Times has since moved to Block West. Simply standing on the street here is to go into sensory overload. On New Year's Eve, multiply the frenzy by thousands when the Big Apple, a ball in the old days, descends and the revolving news strip flashes out another January 1st. Broadway, the Great White Way, cuts through Times Square on a shaft of multicolored light, the most shades of neon this side of Las Vegas, and the greatest concentration of theatrical ambition between London and Hollywood. You can get tickets for most plays at the box office through your hotel, or you can stand in line for half price, day of the performance tickets, at the tickets booth at 47th and Broadway. A few blocks east, 
the United Nations sits beside the East River. A vertical slab of green glass, the Secretariat, is neatly balanced by the low limestone wave of the General Assembly. In characteristic UN fashion, a committee of architects came up with the design. John D. Rockefeller Jr. bought an 18-acre parcel of junkyards, tenements, and slaughterhouses, and donated it for the landscape gardens and buildings of the UN. You can take an inexpensive tour and view the cavernous General Assembly and Council Chamber. At the information desk, ask about reserving a table for lunch in the delegates' dining room. You might have the chance to rub shoulders with some diplomats, or sit in on one of the public sessions and imagine what your own reply might be to one of the speeches. Early in your visit, you should try to take the Circle Line cruise around Manhattan. There's no better way to gain a perspective on the island. Once around, you'll see why the city grew up and not out and that this river-bound chunk of real estate is not so big nor so necessarily overpowering. You'll be thoroughly surprised at how much of the island is open space, even wooded green forests. The boat leaves from Pier 83 at West 43rd Street and 12th Avenue, then goes down the Hudson past the Statue of Liberty in Lower Manhattan. It glides up the East River, then into the narrower Harlem River at the northern tip of the island. Here it turns back down the Hudson under the George Washington Bridge and on into port. The trip lasts about three hours and costs a bit outside of Midtown at 7th Avenue and 34th Street, Madison Square Garden is another sort of arena entirely. Here's where you go to cheer the New York Knicks, the Rangers, and your favorite rock stars. Horse shows and dog shows, rodeos and circuses, all are held in this massive dome next to Pennsylvania Station. Now that you've toured Midtown Manhattan, you can see why we New Yorkers consider this to be the center of the universe. Among the don't miss sites here are the Empire State Building, Rockefeller Center, United Nations, and a good Broadway play. Now let's go a few blocks north to one of the most famous parks in the world. Heaven, to most New Yorkers, sits in an 840-acre rectangle bounded by 59th and 110th Streets and Central Park West and Fifth Avenue. Central Park is a national historic landmark where the natives get both restless and rested. Joggers and horseback riders circle the reservoir on separate tracks, of course. Roller skaters dance to funk music in front of the Tavern on the Green, a restaurant packed with tourists. A more relaxing pastime involves lolling on the sheep's meadow and surveying the skyline from a relaxing distance. Parents keep a watchful eye out for their children in the playground while model sailboats maneuver by remote control on the conservatory pond. On Saturdays, there are ranger-led nature and historical tours. The most romantic way to see the park is to climb aboard one of the horse-drawn hansom cabs lined up at 59th Street and 5th Avenue. On summer evenings, spread out a wine and cheese picnic on the Great Lawn and enjoy outdoor performances by the Metropolitan Opera and the New York Philharmonic.
Other evenings, there's Shakespeare in the park at the nearby Delacorte Theater. And there's even a Victorian castle containing a children's learning center. It's all free. The park is a perfect spot to give the kids some running room, either riding the antique carousel or petting the animals in the children's zoo. Where did King Tutankhamun and Van Gogh go for attention worthy of a rock star? The same place a Maori chieftain spoke to the totem poles to reassure his ancestors' spirits within. The Metropolitan Museum of Art, of course. From its entrance at 5th Avenue and 82nd Street, the Met has expanded by leaps and bounds into the park itself. It's now one of the three largest museums in the world. Once inside, you shouldn't leave until you've lingered over the Egyptian collection and Temple of Dendur, the Michael Rockefeller wing of Oceanic, African, and Central American treasures, the American wing, the Andre Maillet galleries with a great collection of French Impressionists, and the room full of Rembrandt. The Met is the grandest gem along this part of Fifth Avenue, known as Museum Mile, but you can also wear out your eyes and feet at a number of other wonderful museums, including the Jewish Museum, the Museum of the City of New York, and the Cooper Hewitt Museum of Design in the old Andrew Carnegie Mansion. Inside the velvet salons of the Frick Museum, the Vermeers and Titians hang where they've always been, and time seems to have stopped in the sunlit interior courtyard. It's all as steel magnate Henry Clay Frick dictated in his will, down to his ornery prohibition on ladies wearing pants in the library. A gargantuan spiral in concrete, the Guggenheim Museum juts out dramatically on Fifth Avenue at 88th Street. Architect Frank Lloyd Wright drafted this snail design as a challenge to complacency, to make it apparent to all that here was a haven for thoroughly modern art. And it's the only building in New York City that he designed. Take the elevator to the top floor and descend the spiral slowly, past changing exhibitions and a permanent collection that includes works from Georges Brock to Willem de Kooning. On Madison Avenue, that most Europeanized of New York streets, sits the nation's foremost repository of contemporary American art. The Whitney Museum was originally founded in Greenwich Village by Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. Apart from rotating exhibitions, there are paintings from Edward Hopper to Roy Lichtenstein in the permanent gallery. Still everyone's favorite is the Calder Circus. On the west side of the park, dinosaurs and buffalo roam the American Museum of Natural History. Well, they don't actually roam, but they are here. This museum is a warehouse of oddities and marvels, from African reed dresses as big as small tents, to rare gems, human anatomical models and dioramas. There's also a giant screen movie at the Nature Max Theater. The Hall of Asian Peoples is a college course unto itself. And the laser show at the Hayden Planetarium, a guaranteed means of tripping the light fantastic, especially with children. Now that you're deep in the heart of the Upper West Side, take a look at some of the grand apartment buildings lining Central Park West. Then saunter over to that island of L.A. and Manhattan, Columbus Avenue. Edgar Allan Poe once lived in the neighborhood and finished up the Raven in a farmhouse near what is now 84th Street and Broadway. Somewhat later came the Brownstones, now so well preserved on either side of Columbus Avenue, one of the most charming blocks in the city is South Central Park West. Gaze up at the neo-Gothic Cafe and Hotel des Artistes, once home to Isadora Duncan and Noel Coward. From apartment windows up and down the Upper West Side, you may hear opera singers rehearsing and pianists practicing. More than likely, their ultimate goal is Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. This complex of blinding white travertine commands the plaza at 65th Street and Broadway like something out of an ancient empire. It was, in fact, modeled after the Capitoline Hill in Rome. New York City ballets at the New York State Theater, the New York Philharmonic at Avery Fisher Hall, the Met at the Metropolitan Opera House, plays at the Vivian Beaumont and Mitzi Newhouse theaters, and recitals at Alice Tully Hall. There is nothing quite as deliciously expectant 
as entering the Metropolitan Opera under the jaunty colors of the Chagall murals. Then taking your seat and waiting for the Venetian crystal chandeliers to be lifted and the first note to issue forth. On tours during the day, you may well happen onto a rehearsal in progress. Simply walking north up Broadway from Lincoln Center is to witness a cross-section of New York street life in its most concentrated form. Next to health food stores and bookshops, you find boutiques selling $700 suits. New condominium construction spikes the skyline, and the fruit and vegetable stands lend splashes of color to the sidewalks. The Ansonia Hotel on 74th Street was home to Stravinsky, Caruso, and Babe Ruth. And just up Broadway at 81st Street, plunge into Zabar's, the delicatessen legends are made of, a stage for observing New Yorkers hot on the trail of the freshest locks. Riverside Drive, two blocks west of Broadway, once was where Jewish immigrants from the Lower East Side moved when they became financially successful. These stately apartment buildings gave the solidly bourgeois tenants who moved in in the 20s an unmatched panorama of the Hudson River. Leafy, undulating Riverside Park follows the river, and with its flower gardens tended by volunteers, has monuments to spare. Grant's tomb at 122nd Street is the most well-known. But there's also a statue of Joan of Arc at 93rd Street. Between 105th and 106th Streets looms an enormous bronze statue of a Buddhist monk shipped here unscathed after being bombed at Hiroshima. Up around Broadway and 116th Street, it's a bit jarring to come onto the peaceful grounds of Columbia University in this urban cityscape. In the evenings, the West End Bar, a former haunt of Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and other literary lights of the beat movement, now is just another college hangout. If Columbia is unexpected, the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine appears to drop totally out of the blue. Just down from the University on Amsterdam Avenue, St. John's is an interesting mix of styles. European Romanesque surprisingly in sync with Gothic. The cathedral has been under construction since 1892, but it's only two thirds finished. And it's already the largest in the world. Way uptown in Fort Tryon Park, the Cloisters Museum opens a window on medieval life. The unicorn tapestries alone are worth the trip as well as the bluffside vantage point of the George Washington Bridge, one of the most dramatic in Manhattan. It was here that the Indians fled after being pushed northward up the island. The building itself is constructed from the ruins of five European cloisters, shipped over and assembled here on the Hudson River. Although it's too far to walk from Midtown, the ever convenient subway stops here, as well as city buses. As you can see, Uptown is the cultural heart of New York, and the places you shouldn't miss include Lincoln Center, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the American Museum of Natural History, and Central Park. Now let's move all the way down Manhattan Island to its southernmost tip. The European settlement of Manhattan began when Perizzano first sailed into New York Bay in the 1500s. He was soon followed by Henry Hudson, who claimed land for the Dutch. True enough, Peter Minuit bought Manhattan Island from the Indians for $24 in beans. But in a swindle that set a precedent for many more New York would witness, it turned out these particular Indians didn't even own the land. Minuit had been had. But the Dutch held on to their purchase anyway. One of the colony's most outlandish residents was its governor, Peter Stuyvesant. Peg-legged Pete ruled his 1,500 subjects with an iron hand, so much so that the colonists were greatly relieved when the British traded Curaçao to the Dutch in exchange for Manhattan. Little remains of the Dutch and British occupation, but from Battery Park, you can try to imagine how the island looked when Verrazzano first sighted it. Of course, the park, and indeed all the ground south of the old U.S. Customs House at Bowling Green is landfill and didn't even exist then. Spend some time contemplating the harbor from Battery Park and you can see what being a port city has meant to New York. Waves of immigrants pass by the Statue of Liberty on their way to Ellis Island, hoping for acceptance into the United States. 
and only 2% were rejected. Together, these are the world's greatest symbols of freedom. Frederick Bartholdi's copper-clad statue, long a weathered jade color, underwent the most publicized facelift in history for its 100th birthday in 1986. And millions of celebrants pronounced the operation a rousing success. Lady Liberty wasn't always so popular. There was some doubt whether Americans would even pay for the base as part of their agreement with France for the donation of the statue. Ferries leave for the statue from Battery Park slip every hour, and a 20-minute ride drops you off at Liberty Island. Far in the distance lies Staten Island, and the orange triple-decker Staten Island ferry churns by and is gone before you realize it. Even though the fare has jumped from a nickel to a quarter, it's still one of the best ways to see the spectacle of Lower Manhattan. Besides, the view must have improved enough to be worth the extra 20 cents. From Battery Park, walk west on Water Street, past a glass brick memorial etched with letters from U.S. soldiers in Vietnam. Then aim up Broad Street a few blocks to Francis Tavern, where George Washington bid a tearful farewell to his troops. It's now a museum of colonial life and a restaurant. You couldn't keep the general away, however. He returned a few years later to take the oath of inauguration as the first president of the United States on the steps of nearby Federal Hall. Just east of here, the South Street Seaport was built to commemorate the city's connections to the sea. There are dozens of shops and restaurants, nautical museums, and a children's center. The sailors who once boiled through the low brick flop houses and rough and tumble ale houses wouldn't recognize the place. The Fulton Fish Market still revels in its smells and bustle. The market was named after the ferry Robert Fulton ran from Manhattan to Brooklyn after putting his steamship in business. The era when sailing packets set out from the seaport bound for Cape Horn and points west is revived aboard the jet black square rigger Peking. Directly across the pier, the lightship Ambrose is tied up. And nearby, the Pioneer schooner and the side wheeler Andrew Wheeler wait to board passengers for cruises around the harbor. From the end of the pier, you can catch sight of four bridges with the famous Brooklyn Bridge almost overhead. Originally, there really was a wall on Wall Street. It kept the Dutch in and the Indians out. These days, any skirmishes tend to deal in margins and options. The New York Stock Exchange was built on the spot where in 1792, merchants began to drive hard bargains under the shade of a buttonwood tree. The present structure resembles a Roman temple, but inside the wheeling and dealing is anything but reverential. From the viewing gallery, you can look out over a trading floor the size of a football field, absolutely snowed under by scraps of paper. Brokers scurry back and forth among stations while rings of television monitors flash stock prices. At precisely 3.59 and 45 seconds p.m., a bell clangs and the race is over, for the day at least. At the end of Wall Street, the blackened spires of Trinity Church almost hide among a forest of skyscrapers. The present Gothic Revival Church is the third to be constructed on this site, and according to the terms of the church charter granted by William III in 1697, the rent remains one peppercorn a year. Within the church cemetery lie buried Alexander Hamilton and Robert Fulton. The American Stock Exchange got its start trading stocks too minor for the New York Stock Exchange. But its days of conducting business from open office windows is long past. And the pace here may be even more exciting than at its more senior competitor, as traders on the floor use frantic hand signals to co-workers upstairs. It's hard to believe that with every signal, many thousands of dollars change hands. You've undoubtedly caught glimpses of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center from street corners all over the city. At 110 stories each, these shafts of glass and steel don't exactly blend into the background. They are the background. Most of the offices here have one connection or another with the port and the airports and the ground level is mostly shops and eateries. Wait for as clear a day as possible, 
and rocket up the elevator to the observation deck. You might be able to see beaches 50 miles out on Long Island and flea-sized pedestrians crossing the plaza a quarter of a mile below. I always shudder when I think of the aerialist who walked a tightrope between the towers. The view from the elegant Windows on the World restaurant is, if anything, more spectacular. But you'll pay handsomely for the privilege. It's so popular, you need to get reservations often weeks in advance. Lower Manhattan is history. And here you can savor the contrasts between oldest and newest New York. The don't miss sites include the South Street Seaport, the World Trade Center, the stock exchanges, and of course, the Statue of Liberty. Now let's move back north a few blocks to some of New York's great villages and neighborhoods. Chinatown has such expansionist tendencies, it's hard to pin down a center. A prime place to start an expedition is at the intersection of Canal and Mulberry Streets. You know you've arrived when you spot bok choy and dried ginger root, conch, snails, and barrels of live crabs, all jammed together in the side-by-side -side street stalls. So much vies for attention, so many thousands crowd the choked streets, that Chinatown makes Times Square look like a day in the country. Here's the place to pick up a ceremonial sword, discount porcelains, and jars of desiccated herbs that defy identification. Peking ducks encased in dripping brown glaze hang in the windows. Then there are the restaurants seemingly behind every other door. A brunch of dim sum, an inexhaustible array of appetizers brought round to your table on carts is a Sunday tradition. The Chinese first arrived here in the 1870s to escape persecution on the west coast. One of the arrivals, Hua Qi by name, had the dubious distinction of opening the first opium den and gambling parlor for the exclusively male population. Women were allowed to immigrate only years later. The infamous Tong Wars, the bloody feuds between various factions, were fought right here on these streets. To learn more about Chinese cultural history, stop at the museum at number seven Mott Street, Chinatown's first shop. Leave behind the bilingual street signs and pagoda phone booths and cross Canal Street north into Little Italy. Though shrunken to little more than two square blocks, this area still thrives with small cafes and glossy restaurants. Ferrara's 50-foot counter is invariably laden with sinful pastries. And across the street, the facade of Puglia is splashed over in the red and white and green bands of the Italian flag. A famous mafia boss, Crazy Joe Gallo, has gone down in Umberto's clam house but that's no reason to hold anything against their great meals. Following Grand Street west to West Broadway brings you to Soho, where art remade a neighborhood. Even the columns and arches of the buildings rely on an aesthetic illusion. They appear to be stone, but are actually cast iron. Fifteen years ago, Soho, which means south of Houston Street, was all light manufacturing. When the factories moved out, Painters and sculptors discovered these wide open spaces and began to convert them into studios and lofts. The cafeteria, food, at Prince and Wooster Streets started out as a communal kitchen since the lofts originally had none. These days, West Broadway has become the new Madison Avenue. Join the Saturday stroll and you'll pass gallery after gallery with the hottest in contemporary art. Art infects every shop and cafe on the street. There is pricey European fashion as art. Art Deco furniture as art. Even housewares as art. It's quite a carnival of trends. One that has made the neighborhood too expensive for all but the most successful artists. An ironic maxim of New York real estate. North of Houston Street is Greenwich Village, heir to Bohemia. Eccentric yet respectable, home to palm readers without number. The streets themselves reflect its personality. The predictable New York grid has thrown up its arms. Lanes, alleys, muses, and courts run every which way. Approach it like the village it is, and you'll do fine. Washington Square is the unofficial center, dividing the more staid and established West Village from the brasher, still avant-garde East Village. In 1822, settlers fled here to what was then a rambling tobacco plantation, 
to escape a yellow fever epidemic ravaging lower Manhattan. Washington Square Arch, reminiscent of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, was erected to mark the centennial of George Washington's inauguration. And all around the park are buildings belonging to New York University. Off-Broadway theater began in the village, with playwrights like Grove Street resident Eugene O'Neill and Edward Albee having plays premiering here. There are many excellent theaters offering a variety of fine entertainment, and tickets usually cost less than Broadway. The great virtue of the village has always been its tolerance. It was here in the Cooper Union that Abraham Lincoln delivered the Right Makes Might speech that set the tone for the war against slavery. Bleecker Street and McDougal is Coffee House Central. And there are more rock and jazz clubs than you could soak up in a month. There's always a scene to be had, whether it's in the galleries springing up in rundown East Village tenements, or fashion boutiques and shops that give styles from the 50s and 60s a brand new shop in the arm. At 7th and 3rd is McSorley's Old Ale House, where women, once banned, are now free to indulge in beer, ale, and pretzels if they want. Up on Broadway sits Venerable Grace Church, whose quiet aplomb was shattered the day the midget Tom Thumb was married here. Showman P.T. Barnum thought it would be good publicity to open the event to all comers. The gawkers streamed in, glad to join one more of Barnum's circuses. Soho and Greenwich Village almost require you to get lost. The streets are the thing. The art, the fashions, the hairstyles, the music you experience here will usually filter out to the rest of the country in a year or two. Remember, you saw it first in New York. Professional sports are a major part of the New York scene. And New Yorkers are involved with all the avidity you'd expect of people crammed into small offices and still smaller apartments. These are the fans' fans. When the teams are hot, they can do no wrong. When they're not, don't ask. You'll find the Yankees playing baseball at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, and the Mets at Shea Stadium in Flushing, Queens. In Madison Square Garden, the Knicks continue to keep the faith on the basketball court, as do the Rangers on the hockey rink. The Islanders skate at Nassau Coliseum on Long Island. You can usually get tickets for sports through your hotel or at a Ticketron outlet. In the world of horse racing, Belmont on Long Island is known as one-third of the Triple Crown. For harness racing, try Yonkers, the Meadowlands, or Roosevelt Raceway in Westbury, Long Island. Of course, if you prefer to win big without actually seeing the race, there are legal OTB, or off-track betting parlors, ready to take your money, scattered all over the city. If anything exceeds the obsession with sports, it's the mania for food. New Yorkers treat restaurants as extensions of their offices or living rooms. A change of scenery when the same four walls begin to close in. Culinary trends tend to shift faster than the time it takes to fire up a mesquite grill. And the choices and the combinations, endless. Where else would you find a kosher Japanese restaurant down the street from both Ethiopian and Indian specialties? Most top-rated restaurants are in mid-Manhattan, and you can literally spend weeks trying new places and never eat in the same place twice. If your budget allows, Try some of the more famous ones like the 21 Club, Lutece, Le Bernardin, The Four Seasons, Le Cirque, Caravelle, Grenouille, Le Côte Basque. And the Russian Tea Room is a favorite with celebrities and their agents. There are some great delis near the theaters and concert halls, and they usually are filled with both cast members and the audiences late in the evening. Places like the Hard Rock Cafe attract a younger set of film stars and musicians. Greenwich Village is brimming with expensive French bistros and Italian restaurants of every level of sophistication. Among the famous or infamous taverns, depending upon your perspective, are the Lion's Head, Chumley's, the White Horse, and Pete's, all in and around the village. New York's nightlife doesn't know the meaning of the word stop. In Midtown, there's ballroom dancing at many hotels. There's rock and roll, country and western, and everything else that's currently hot. Anybody else there from Connecticut? Trying to get your ride home, but I don't. Uh... The village is jazz, and you'll have dozens of choices where the music often goes on until the early morning hours. To find updated listings of what's going on while you're here, check the New York Daily Papers, the Village Voice, New York Magazine, or the New Yorker. As you can see, New York offers just about any entertainment you can imagine. 
But the one thing that's missing is only a short trip down the New Jersey coast. Casino gambling. It's put Atlantic City back on the map. This once run-down seacoast resort, 120 miles south of New York City, has enjoyed a resurgence ever since the first casino, Resorts International, opened in 1978. What started out as a sleepy retreat for fishermen became, by the early part of this century, a glittering resort with rambling 400 to 600 room hotels lining the shore. The first boardwalk was built so that the guests would not keep tracking sand onto hotel carpets. The Miss America pageant spread the town's fun and games reputation still further. And who didn't first learn of Atlantic City streets through playing the game of Monopoly? Deep sea fishing charters chug into the inlet marina, laden with tuna, bluefish, or marlin, depending on what's running. And there may be better luck dropping a line off one of the piers than plunking down chips inside at the roulette tables. Surely the safest, most uncomplicated bed of all remains a dip in the ocean from the long, curling strand. It's still free. Well, that's a look at my city, New York. We didn't see everything, of course. There's enough here for another whole program. For instance, we have great beaches at Fire Island and Coney Island and Long Island, the Great Bronx Zoo, the West Point Military Academy, and much more. Your biggest problem is going to be deciding among all the choices. And no matter what time of year you come, there's always something special going on. You just can't help getting caught up in the energy of a great city like this. Now, in the final portion of our video trip, we'll look at some of the things you'll need to know to make your trip to New York easier and more fun. New York is accessible from virtually anywhere in the world. There are three major airports. Most domestic arrivals come into LaGuardia or Newark, while international flights and those from the West Coast land at John F. Kennedy. Taxis for the 40-minute ride from Kennedy into Manhattan should run around $25 and $15 for the 20-minute trip in from LaGuardia. A taxi from Newark is about $30 and should take close to 45 minutes. A standard tip for all taxi trips is 15%. Airport buses will drop you off in Midtown at Grand Central Station, the Port Authority Terminal, or the Hilton Hotel near Rockefeller Center. The fare from Kennedy is $8 and from LaGuardia, $6. Buses from Newark arrive at Port Authority and cost $4. There is subway service from Midtown. The cost is $2.50. If you drive into Manhattan from south and west, you have several choices of ways into the city. The Holland Tunnel enters Lower Manhattan at Canal Street. The Lincoln Tunnel comes in around Midtown at 38th Street. And the George Washington Bridge gets you into the city way uptown around 179th Street. The Henry Hudson Bridge comes into the northern tip of the island. The Triborough Bridge enters from the east at 125th Street. And the Queensborough Bridge lands you on 59th Street, while the Queens Midtown Tunnel feeds directly into 42nd Street. Amtrak arrives at Pennsylvania Station, a particularly convenient way to avoid airports at both ends if you're coming from somewhere relatively close, like Philadelphia, Washington, or Boston. The Metro Liner from Washington shaves even more time off the regular schedule. Greyhound, Trailways, and a number of smaller bus companies also serve Manhattan and arrive night and day at Port Authority. New York is the Walker City Supreme, but the pace will fatigue your feet before you know it. The best approach is to pick one area to explore, exhaust it in yourself, then take a taxi, bus, or subway back to your hotel, start again the next day. The caveat that all New Yorkers learn faster than it takes to recognize an off-duty cab is to avoid driving in the city at all costs. Unless you like the sheer challenge of finding non-existent parking spaces, sparring with taxis for traffic lanes that suddenly disappear, or paying exorbitant parking fees. That said, it is possible to drive in this city, but sensible only after eight in the evening. Taxis, of course, are the most convenient means of going longer distances. The fare works out to around $5 from Midtown to the village or from the east side to the west. You can tell if a cab is available if the numbers on the roof are lit up. If they are, get out there and wave it down. The subways have a forbidding reputation, some of it absolutely justified. The stations can be dirty and noisy, the trains themselves covered with graffiti. 
Still, some three and a half million people ride safely every day, and you should definitely give it a try. The subway is certainly the fastest way to travel, particularly if you're going from way uptown to way downtown or vice versa. With a minimum of effort and a subway map, the basic routes of the lines are easy enough to master. And if you're not sure, ask. With a single token, you can ride the whole system. The tokens are a dollar and you buy them from booths inside the stations. New York weather is known for its extremes. A damp wind in February can make your very bones feel like ice. And on a hot August afternoon, you beg for the slightest breath of air. During summer, average highs are around 85 degrees Fahrenheit, but there will be occasional days approaching 100. Summer lows average in the 60s. Average winter highs are about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and winter lows are in the mid-20s, but it can get much colder. You should also be prepared for a little rain, as New York averages between three and four inches every month. The city can be as formal as you make it, and just about anything goes for streetwear, depending, of course, on which street. Few restaurants absolutely require a tie, but you're likely to feel more comfortable in a jacket. Most of the big name hotels are in mid-Manhattan. Here you'll find regal luxury at the Essex House, the Plaza, Regency, the Carlisle, and the Waldorf Astoria. There are a number of newer luxury hotels, like the Grand Hyatt, New York, the Marriott Marquis, the New York Hilton, and the UN Plaza. In the Wall Street area, the Vista International is the most popular. Rates at any of the larger hotels are generally well above $100 a night, but there are some that have rooms just under the century mark. Just make sure your travel agent knows your budget. For more information, call or go by the New York Convention and Visitors Bureau at 2 Columbus Circle and Broadway. The Bureau is open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., and weekends, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Driving to Atlantic City by bus or car takes about two and a half hours from New York. There are also regularly scheduled airline flights leaving from both Newark and LaGuardia. The casinos cooperate with numerous bus companies on round-trip packages, and the round-trip fare runs around $22. The casino hotels dominate the beachfront and rooms generally run at least $80 a night. You can find a bit more moderately priced accommodations a few blocks in from the water. For more information, contact the Visitors Bureau, 2300 Pacific Avenue, Atlantic City, New Jersey, 08401. Now you should be all set to visit and enjoy the Big Apple, New York. And when you do, Rand McNally has several items to make your trip easier. Check your local bookstore for items like the Rand McNally Road Atlas and the New York City Street Finder. Thank you for letting me be your host. I'm Tony Randall, inviting you to New York City and hoping you have a great trip.
There are many other Rand McNally programs to great vacation destinations around the world. For a free brochure, call this toll-free number or ask for Rand McNally video trips at your favorite video store or bookstore. Sure, your vacation is exactly the way you want it to be.